Welcome to the Sheridan Report, brought to you by MyBookie.com, or, yeah, MyBookie.ag. On the Grilly True Sports Network, you can go to MyBookie.ag, put in the promo code TGT100 to get up to 100% cash back bonus on your first deposit up to $300, or you can go to the Grilling Truth, well, yeah, you go to the GrillyTruth.com, click on the MyBookie.ag banner at the top of that page, and still get the $300 bonus. But I'm going to tell you all a secret. That's going to change the $1,000 bonus on 100% of what you do tomorrow, and it'll be a different company. But don't don't tell anybody. All right, I'm your co-host for the Sheridan Report, Mike Goodpaster. And right now, I'd like to welcome in my co-host, Bobby Sheridan. How you doing, Bobby? Hey, Mike. I'm doing great. And, uh, you know, I was really pleased about how last night finished. We hit two top plays there at the end of the, of the evening, and, you know, the Raptors, Mike, I think they're making more and more believers. Um, this series is going to have a lot of little angles going into each game, it looks like. And the newest one, you may have already gone over it. I don't know, but Durant is supposed to be able to play and start in starting game three. And I, it was kind of my hunch, you know, it's kind of my hunch. And if he is able to play, we'll see what that does to this series. I think as is right now. Toronto's going to win the series as is. Um, but there are some possible changing landscapes. we got to see how Cousins works into this a little bit more. we got to see what happens game two because I think if Toronto comes out and wins game two on Sunday, and we'll go over this tomorrow on our show, I'm not ready to give any prediction yet, but if Toronto wins game two, barring – Durant becoming the MVP of the series, I think Toronto's going to win the series. I think the Warriors will fire their best shot without the Durant part of it. They will fire a really, really, really good shot on Sunday, and we'll know a lot about what's happening. So that's the NBA. I really, I really was pleased yesterday with Siakam and Danny Green. You know, they've got a lot of different players that can step up to the plate. Gasol played great. That's a good team, Mike. That's a championship-level team. So we'll see what happens with game two. It, to me, game two is, is just huge. All righty. So I, I think the so thing now, is, huh? I was going to say, yeah, give, uh, give me your opinion and roll that into mm-hmm. your NHL when you're done. My opinion is this. I don't know what the hell the NHL has got to do with the NBA, but I'll give it a shot. Um, <laughs> what I look no, at I mean, la- after. when I look at last night's game one, the thing that stood out to me was Leonard only scored 23 points. He had an average game, and they still won by almost double digits. I think they're yeah. – and Kyle Lowry – Better than the pass at the end of the game. Didn't do a whole lot. Only scored seven points. Now, I think the big question here is, is Pascal Siakam coming into his own, and is he now a dominant NBA player? And I think if these playoffs have went on, I think he's been the biggest difference in this team because he seems to be maturing every game. And to come out in your first NBA Finals game and hit 14 out of 17 shots, (laughs) <laughs> and to dominate the game the way he did. And then Mark Gasol with 20. If Mark Gasol scoring 20, the Raptors are winning. Because there's nothing that Golden State can do inside that can keep up with that. I mean, their starting center played eight minutes and had two points. So when I look at this, my biggest takeaway from this is if Leonard would have played 45 minutes and scored 48 points and they won by three, I would say, ah, we'll see what happens. Let's see if Leonard can do that four more times. But my big takeaway from this game is this. He got held to 23 points, and they still won the game rather easily. And if I'm Golden State, that would scare the hell out of me. And if I'm Toronto, that gives me a ton of confidence. Well, yeah, I mean, Danny Green hitting threes again. You know, uh, 30 points from Lowry and Leonard. But it's well, look at all the other things those two guys do. They play great defense. They pass. They, you know, that this is a, a good team, Mike. This yeah, is but a it's really, like really this, Bobby. Team. In 1990, 
when the Pistons would beat the Bulls, it was because Jordan was or Jordan was held by Dumars under 30 points. They called it the Jordan rules. Kwame Leonard was held yeah. under 30 points, and they still won comfortably. That is why I'm confident with this now. This game, too, is huge, especially with Durant yeah. coming back, because Durant's going to give him a boost, but the question is, with a calf injury, how big of a boost? Is this a boost that is just mental at the start of the game and wears off, or does Durant come out and drop 40, and all of a sudden he looks awesome? The thing is this. That third game, if Durant can start even and give them an emotional boost, boost and they win, and it makes it two games to one Raptors, game four, you're going to have, which is normal, an emotional letdown from the game three if you're Golden State. So then Toronto's got game five at home. If they win one of those two, they're up three to two, you know, and game seven's at home. I like the Raptors no matter what here. I think this is going to be a six or seven game series. But if they get game two, this could be a sweep if Durant's not 100% when he comes back. Yeah, there's going to be some variables that to pop up that we still don't know. And, you know, as, as a Raptor guy who I, I took the series you know, before, of course I want them to go up 2-0. I think if they go up 2-0, barring Durant, coming back and being named the finals MVP over these over the next five. Barring that, I think Toronto's got this series that they go up 2-0. I do. All right. NHL-wise, so, I think we've got what I expected, which I talked about this before the series started, where there's not a lot of space. It's going to be a grinding series. It's going to be a physical series. TV ratings are down because of that, I think. People like wide open crap and – I like people that will bang with each other and get violent. So I enjoy this stuff. (laughs) Um, The next game's in St. Louis. I think this is a huge game that Boston needs to get. Um, I I think St. Louis's top line scored all three of their goals in the last game. And that top line has been the difference so far. I think Bennington will be the difference here. I I think they're going to get the next two at home, drop game five in Boston, and win it all in game six. But – That's what I thought at the start, so I may be stacking that a little bit. Because if I look at this, common sense would tell me out of the next two games, it's probably going to be a split, if that makes any sense. And we're going to go back. Well, yeah, because the games are are even, yeah. Yeah, but for some reason, I think this. I I think the St. Louis Blues, and this is not a rip at them, but I think the Blues are just like them. They're physical. They're violent. But I, I just like the Blues goaltender a little bit better, and I think Tarasenko, and that's the one that I, that was the key I gave you to this series. Right now, if you had an MVP of this series, it'd be Tarasenko. And at the end of this series, he'll be the MVP, or Bennington will be the MVP. It'll be one of the two. So I, I'm still kind of wavered on whether we should split the picks here, because it wouldn't surprise me to see the Bruins come back and get one tomorrow, even. But we're going to think about that, look at it a little bit more. And while I do that, and we'll give you that pick tomorrow at 2 o'clock on the Sheridan Report. Bobby, what do we got for baseball? Because baseball's the only thing we got today. Yeah, my baseball, you know, we had a really nice win with the Angels last night. We caught them as a plus one. What we get? I got them a different I – I kept buying them. <laughs> I got them at 103, 105, 110, and 113, I think. And they won easy. So, you know, there's a, an anomaly, right? An easy win in baseball. I and mean, usually I'm blowing sure wins in the ninth lately. Two of them went back-to-back days. That's not even get into that. But it was a nice win, and, and I'm hoping we roll that momentum into today. I really like the card a lot. You know, and I know I say that often, but I, I really do. We got the – let's go over two top plays, Mike. Pittsburgh Pirates tonight at 4.05. Okay, Chris Archer is going against Chasin. This is a NL Central rivalry, NL Central matchup. Milwaukee took game one yesterday. Now Pittsburgh throws Chris Archer. You know, when they traded for Archer at the All-Star break last year, it was with this year in mind. Pittsburgh was a fringe wildcard contender. And this was a bit of an upset in terms of trading for him because he was one of the arms that was on the block. And they really weren't one of the teams. They wound up giving three prospects for him, Mike, including one of their very best. 
outfielder named Meadows for him. With with they knew they had talent. They knew they had this Reynolds coming up and Moran, who have been good left handed hitters. Josh Bell's become an MVP candidate, starting Marte's a star outfielder, among two or three other really good players. A good young shortstop, Cole Tucker. This is a good team that's emerging. They need an anchor. And Archer starts the year out, pitching against the NL Central, divisional opponents. He goes 1 0 with a 2 ERA, goes 15 innings over two starts, and locks it down. Ready to start this season, no doubt. Then pitches three, four games where he's average, average, average. Goes on the DL with a leg injury. Okay? Comes back off the DL. Nah, average, average. Third start, his last start. And I often like to bet the third start after the DL. And he was, eh, again. Well, now we're back to the NL Central. This is his third start since those first two to open the season. And he dominated the two, the two opponents. He's got a shot today, and I think today he's sitting on a big performance. You know, I really do. I watched his last outing. He was an eyelash away from putting it together. I mean, I think he does here today. When he trusts his off-speed stuff and he throws change-ups, basketball counts, and things like that, he's a lot better pitcher than when he just tries to throw the fastball. And Milwaukee on the road has been not great. Chassin, their starter, he's 0-3 in his last four starts, 2-6 and six overall. This is the guy that opened up a couple of their playoff series last year. And, and I really like him. He's got a swing the bat. Well, he's a good pitcher, but he's not getting it done. I think Pittsburgh is a good play tonight as a home underdog, plus 114. And then the other top play, Mike, is a sneaky one. We're going to Dodger Stadium. We're going we're gonna to buck those Dodgers tonight. At plus 147 with Jake Arietta. And Arietta, I think in today's steroid ball, where the fastballs get thrown 98 and they get out, they get hit out 112. And we have, you know, multiple Bonds Kanye matchups every night. I even tweeted that video or I rewatched it. Jake Arietta, he doesn't really allow that because he, he pitches on, with movement on his fastball. He's not trying to blow it by the hitters. He's trying to set them up. He's trying to use his movement, throw pitches that look like balls that become strikes and vice versa. So this is the kind of pitcher that's probably in today's age going to be more effective keeping these hitters off balance a little bit in late movements. See, Greg, Greg Maddox would have been great pitching even in today's era because he had all the movement. He didn't. It wasn't about velocity. It was his control, his movement on his pitches, and – his command and his mental level five, his mental ability on the mound. He'd set hitters up for the second and third time. Jake Arias got, got a lot of that in him. And I think tonight he's going to really throw a good start. And Philadelphia's got an offense that can bang with the Dodgers. This is a potential playoff matchup. I think Philadelphia brings it tonight and plus 147. Going against, there's two Dodgers starters that I that you really want to be going against. That's Maeda or Hill. I think both of those guys are gettable. Maeda only averages five innings in his starts. This is his 12th or 14th start. Only averages five innings, which means you can't just hand the ball to Jansen like last night. Last night, Ryu got it to Jansen. They, they shut off the Mets. What's the Dodgers' heel? Achilles' heel right now is the bullpen before Jansen. Dodgers will probably be in the market for a, a reliever, you know, at the July deadline because that's their that's their Achilles heel right now so I think we can we can you know explore that tonight and have a nice one so there's your two top plays I have two other straights that we can you know go over or not go over and that's either way but let, let me tell you my mix and match uh that I that I like tonight I'll go over that for you um there's three favorites that hook together We'll pay three. Uh, actually, pay three sixty-five, and I put this together, Mike. And when I uh, recalculated it this morning, it had gone up to closer to four to one, about four to one. And that's the Nationals, the Indians, and the Braves. So that's the three-teamer. And the Braves of those three, I think, were the biggest lock of those three. You got Detroit, the American League team, going to the National League, losing the DH. 
getting outpitched and outplayed badly tonight by the Braves. So I think that's the three. And then I added the Angels tonight. There was no line. I uh, cannot bet them straight. They're 133. But I think the Angels are, are playing their best ball right now. So you can probably mix and match with them as you feel fit also. All right, so Mike, Bobby. there's your baseball. What do we got for on this day, Poppy? I already know. I'm just asking. <laughs> I know you know. And you know it's what? One of my you're, favorite you're NBA the... teams of all time, by the way. That's right. 1983, the Sixers, and the Lakers. Yeah. And somebody got swept. And it, it made me very happy. I, I loved Dr. J when I was growing up. Dr. J and Walt Clyde Frazier. I used to carry their basketball cards in my wallet. But I, I remember the Sixers in 1977 made the finals with George McGinnis, Dr. J, and those guys. Um, who was the little guard? Doug Collins. And they lost in six games. They got upset by the Portland Trail Blazers. 78-79, they lose in the playoffs. 1980, they go back to the finals and get beat by Magic his first time in the finals. 82, they lose again in the finals. And sandwiched in between there, the two losses to the Lakers, was an 81 Game 7 loss to the Celtics where they were actually up three games to one and blew the series. And that moves us to 1983. In 1983, Harold Katz bought the Sixers actually in 82. But on his watch, the final piece of that puzzle came. And one of the greatest trades, or worst trades, according if you're a Rockets fan or a Sixers fan, came when Moses Malone, who was a free agent or center, came from the Houston Rockets in a sign-and-trade deal with Caldwell Jones. That team was Julius Irving, Maurice Cheeks, Andrew Toney, Bobby Jones, Moses Malone. Mark Ivoroni started and played like eight minutes a game. He'd screw up. They'd take him out. But in the regular season, <clears throat> they dominated. They were 49-7 and seven at one point, won 65 games as a whole. And Julius Irving was named as the NBA All-Star Game MVP. Moses Malone was the NBA MVP. <coughs> and the thing people seem to remember the most is fo fo fo, which was uh, there was three rounds of the series. You had the conference semifinals because it was only six teams that made the playoffs. And six would play right. number three, four would play five in best two out of three series. The four left would play conference semifinals and in conference finals. And Moses Below was basically predicting they wouldn't lose a game in the playoffs. And he missed by one because they lost one game in the playoffs. So they went 12-1. and one, And that is still, I think it's the third best record ever because we had a Warriors team. I think it was the 16-17 Warriors went 16-1. and one, And then the 0-1 Lakers went 15-1. and one. Sixers were 12-1. and one, But the sw- Sixers swept the Knicks. The thing I remember about that is I remember listening to those games on the fan out of New York when I was in Ohio because you used to be able to get anything within about 3,000 miles, it seemed like, at night on AM radio. And (laughs) the thing that stood out to me is I think all four of those games were close. The Knicks had a good team. That was Bernard King. Um, Yeah. The second best team that year was considered to be the Celtics who won 56 games, but the Celtics got upset by the Bucks, who I think swept the Celtics, if I remember right, four straight. Um, the Sixers beat the Knicks, and then the Sixers played the Bucks. Bucks were a great team. That was the Sidney Moncrief, Bob Lanier, all those guys. And what I remember about that series is game one at the Spectrum was a classic. They win it, I think, in overtime by two points. They get another five- or six-point win. They get an eight-point win at Milwaukee. They're up three games to nothing. Looks like he's going to have two-thirds of his foes ready. And then Milwaukee beats them in game four. Philly comes, wipes them out in the Spectrum to win game five. And that sets up Lakers-Sixers. few things here. Number one. The NBA was not always as big as it is now. And the 1983 NBA Finals are the first finals that were ever shown in prime time every game. And what I mean by that is I remember 1980, 81, 82, most of those games were taped delay. So, like, game six in 1982 of the Lakers and Sixers, I had to watch that at 1130 at night. It had already been played. It was taped delayed. 
and watch the game that way. Now, if you had a game on a Saturday or a Sunday, which game one was usually like on a Saturday or Sunday, you would get that game live. The games during the week, though, would always be tape delayed. So like 1978, for example, game seven, Bullet Supersonics, was nationally televised. Game six, five, four, and two were all tape delayed. And it really sucked back then because you had to go out of your way not to pay attention to the news. I, I remember, like, that 82 game six, watching the sports before, and they would say, all right, we're going to show you highlights, and we're going to tell you about what happened at the game tonight at the Philadelphia Spectrum or the Forum, wherever it was. And they said, so if you don't want to see this, just turn your TV off for a minute, then you turn it back on, and the game will be on after that. And that's what you'd have to do. But Magic and Larry changed that. And when they got the new TV contract, everything changed. And we got all these games live. And the thing that really struck me about these games is the Lakers were missing one of their best players. So they were missing James Worthy, who got hurt earlier in that season. And the Sixers had added Moses Malone. And you go game one. The Lakers actually led, I think the Lakers led every one of these games at halftime. And then in the second half, the Sixers would just blow their doors off. And the leading scorer, I think, in that game one was Norm Nixon, who had like 26 or 30 points. And people forget how good Norm Nixon was. And I think Norm Nixon was not the, I think Norm Nixon was chased off of that team by Magic Johnson, Bobby. He may have been, you know, because he was a point guard. I think, I think the Lakers or Magic, when the other wanted to go in another direction, they had the ball more in Magic hands, not not needing the, the small little point guard, and they traded him for Byron Scott. Byron yeah, which Scott was a was great trade. Out. Byron Scott was a more yeah. a bigger, more physical player who could defend better. But Norm he Nixon defend, was a yeah. hell of a – Norm Nixon was better than Byron Scott. But I think maybe Scott fit fit what they needed more. Because yeah. with Johnson and Nixon, you had six nine and what six foot was Nixon right around six foot. Right. But, yeah, there and then Byron a, Scott, I think, was like six four, yeah. six five, wasn't he? Yeah, and for the fans are, to realize this, uh, some of them may not. This was not a veteran Byron Scott. This was a rookie. They got his. They traded for him as a rookie out of Arizona State. Um, the Clippers had drafted him with, like, the fourth pick overall. Yeah, and everybody <laughs> thought that they were nuts for getting rid of Norm Nixon. Right. But, yeah, it wound up being a great trade for not only that year, but, I mean, down the road. Uh, Byron Scott played a big role. And Magic and Byron were, um, became very close, and they still are to this day. And so Jamal that, Wilkes was a that. big part of this team, too. He had that funky shot. Still don't know how he made the shots. But. Yeah, Wilkes, this was the end of Wilkes and, and Nixon was 83. Kind of the end of those guys, I think. And well, Wilkes, and, Wilkes uh, still played a lot in '84 and '85. Oh, it was he, the end right, for Nixon so in '83. Oh, yeah, right. Okay. I think Wilkes played on the '85 team that won it all, and then okay, I think so that he was gone in '85. And then they had Michael yeah. Cooper, who was one of the best defensive guards you'll ever see. He was a shutdown player. He was kind of like the guard version and Dennis Rodman before Rodman was. They also had Bob McAdoo, who was a great scorer, never saw a shot that he didn't like. Uh, and then they get to game two. And game two was the game Moses Malone dominated like he did game one. But the player that stood out to me, and the player that really got this team going, because they're down four or five at the half, and then Bobby Jones came out and just played a great second half. I think he had like 14 points in the second half. And they go to L.A., and still, most people that are Sixer fans are just waiting for something to go wrong. And Game 3 was about as good as you'll ever see the Sixers play. And the thing about this is this. The Lakers jumped out to a 32-21 to lead at the end of the first period. They were still up three at halftime. Game was tied at the end of the third quarter. That fourth quarter, the Philadelphia 76ers outscored them in the forum 111-94. to and they were dominant, and it was Bobby Jones again, stealing the ball, blocking shots. He scored 17 points. Most of those were in that fourth quarter. And then you had Dr. J dropped 21, Andrew Tony dropped 21, Moses Malone 28, Maurice Cheeks 12. I mean, this was a great team because when you looked at them on the bench, 
Offensively, they were really good with their starters. Maurice <laughs> Cheeks and Andrew Tony are one of the most underrated backcourts that ever lived. Moses Malone was a great defensive center. But when you look at their bench, they had Bobby Jones, Clint Richardson, Clement Johnson, and Earl Curitan, who were all four really good defensive players. And I know Johnson, Richardson, and Jones all averaged about 20, 25 minutes a game in this series. And I think at the end, when you look at it, the difference was the bench in these series or in this series, because the Lakers, yeah, Michael Cooper played well, but Bob McAdoo's not giving you anything defensively. So this really, this Lakers team was really a six-man team. You had Cooper, the five starters. Bob McAdoo was a guy that he was just good for hitting shots, and if he wasn't hitting shots, you were playing basically with six guys. So I think the big difference in this series and what we've talked about during this NBA playoffs and finals so far is the team that's bench does the best usually is the team that wins these games. And when you look at this, the Sixers were eight or nine deep. The Lakers were six. You might be able to give them seven deep. They go to game four at L.A., and the thing I remember here was the breakaway dunk by Dr. J at the end of the game and, you know, him in tears on the sideline. And this is another game. You get to halftime here, and the Lakers were up by 14 points. They're up 11 at the end of three, and in the fourth quarter, the Sixers outscore them by 18. And Bobby Jones, 13 points, two block shots, four steals. I mean, Bobby Jones was the unsung hero of this. And when you look at the Lakers, they just they got a lot of scoring from four guys. Because Kurt Rambis, if you remember Kurt Rambis, he started – and he was a solid player for what he was good for. But, I mean, he's just not a fifth guy that's going to score points. The bad thing is with this 83 Sixers team is the next year they suffered one of the largest upsets in NBA history where they lost to the New Jersey Nets and Michael Ray Richardson. And they got beaten five in a best-of-five series. And if I remember right, the way this went, the first two games, the Nets won at the Spectrum in Philadelphia. So everybody thinks the Sixers are done. Games three and four were at the Meadowlands, Brendan Byrne Arena in New Jersey, and the Sixers win games three and four at or at New Jersey. You go back to game five, and everybody's thinking, well, the Sixers have straightened us up now, and the Sixers are going to wipe their finish this up. Not to be as Michael Ray Richardson and Buck Williams played out of their asses and actually beat Philadelphia in five. Now, they'd go on to lose to Milwaukee in the conference semifinals in six games. And then, of course, Michael Ray Richardson would lose his battle with addiction. So that was about the only time that team was really relevant with Michael Ray Richardson. But Michael Ray Richardson could have been one of the greatest point guards in NBA history if he could have just right. kept his nose clean. But that's all right. I got on the 1983 Philadelphia 76ers. Oh, that's good stuff. And yeah, Richardson was a big point guard that could uh, – sort of like a magic, right? He was about 6'5", you know, taller, bigger guy, and they could handle the ball really well and pass the ball. I think maybe Magic may have spurned on his emergence at that position, you know, because Magic was doing that you know, six years before that and, you know, college and started the pros. And, and that's the – wow. And then Boston Boston comes back and wins it in 84, right? Boston yeah, Boston won it all in 84. Boston – Let's see. Lakers and, got 85. And Boston 80, 85, the Celtics made it to the finals. But the Sixers never made it back to the finals until 2001 when Allen Iverson took them. Right, yeah. And Moses, wow. Moses, for some reason, I don't remember why he left so quick, but Moses, after a couple of years, was out of there. And by 86 or 87, he was a Washington Bullet. Right. And actually, yep, in 1988, the first year the Pistons went to the NBA Finals, in the first round series, Moses played really well, and it was a best of five series. And actually, Washington beat the Bad Boys twice in that series and pushed that to a five game series. Oh, I did not remember that. Wow. Yeah, they blew him out game five in Detroit, but Moses played his ass off in games three and four at Washington, and they upset the Pistons in both of those games and actually forced a fifth and deciding game, but came up short. They lost by like 15 or 20 in game five. Mm. Wow. The eighties has just gotten nothing like it. 
you know, the 80s in the NBA was just unbelievable. And then the 90s, we had, you know, Jordan. And then now yeah, that sucked. Yeah, the NBA and, died after the bad boys lost to the Bulls in 91. Uh, didn't die. In my yeah, it died. Jordan, I don't care man. about no Michael Jordan crap. Most overrated player I've ever seen. Screw Michael Jordan. Got his dad killed, too, because he lost money on a bet that he didn't pay. <laughs> it's well, true. I, I believe I believe Michael that. Jordan's a scumbag. Michael Jordan don't make a pimple on Larry Bird or Magic Johnson's ass because without Larry Bird, Magic Johnson, and Dr. J, the NBA would have never been anything. Yes, Mike. I agree with you there. I agree with you on the on the gambling part, which was not good. But he he saved the NBA in the '90s because it would have got it was going to go in the tank. I think without him, no, it wouldn't have went in the tank because Bird and Magic had already saved it. You'd have just had the Houston Rockets winning and the Utah Jazz and oh, screw Michael Jordan. I don't like him, and there's nothing wrong with betting, but there is something wrong with not paying your debts when you lose. Pete Rose. <laughs> <laughs> well, and Pete Rose was throwing games. Right. Who knows what Michael Jordan did? Yeah. But he yeah. usually won, so you can't really question him. With Pete Rose, you just question it because his team kept coming in second until he was gone. <laughs> 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 they usually finished second All by right. about seven or eight games. That was the game or two or every month he would bet against them. All right, Bobby, we're going to wrap it up. Remember, check out Phil Rankin's The Handicapping Guide. Go halfway down on thegruelingtruth.com. Click on the banner. Make sure you go to thesheridanreport.com where you can get Bobby's top play of the day for $5. Or you can get his daily Sheridan Report for 10 Or you just buy everything for an entire month, and that's $50. You can also follow Bobby at Sheridan Report. But... Other than that, we're going to have to wrap it up now, Bobby, because I really got to go to the bathroom pretty bad. So, remember, okay, you can hear <laughs> all of our shows on iHeartRadio, iTunes, TuneIn, Spreaker, Stitcher. See, this is the difference between me and Steve Risley. If you're listening, Steve, you're always full of shit. I'm going to get rid of mine. You're always going to have yours. <laughs> So, for Bobby Sheridan, I'm Mike Goodpastor. You've been listening to The Grueling Truth, where the legends speak. See you guys.